Hello everyone, this is Mirko Guerrini and I welcome you to the Jazz Transcription Clinic, a monthly interviews podcast where we talk with accomplished jazz doctors about their lives, career and their personal secrets on the art of transcribing. If you want to improve at jazz, stay tuned and follow the Jazz Transcription Clinic on the socials for more content. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is being recorded. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jazz Transcription Clinic podcast. Today our guest doctor is one of the most renowned saxophone players, composer, arranger that uh, we are delighted to have here in Australia. And his name is Lachlan Davidson. Welcome, Lachlan. Thank you, Mirko. So I, I think uh, Lachlan is one of the first, the very first saxophone players I have heard here in Australia. Uh, when I came to visit before I decided to move here, I went to a gig, I think it was the Monash Art Ensemble playing, and there was uh, you playing all sorts of woodwinds, uh, and there was also one of uh, another great saxophone player that I like a lot here in Australia, Tony Hicks. You were on the same gig, and I think you were playing some sort of suite uh, written by Paul Grabowski, and I enjoyed a lot. And at, at the same time, I started having doubts about the option of moving out here because uh, the level was so high, the standard level of all the musicians that I heard in, in that week was so high that I said, mm, I will have to work hard you know, <laughs> to, to try to fit in, in such a great musical scene. And after that, it happened that we both teach at the same university and we shared also some gigs together. We played in some uh, ensembles together and I started learning and appreciate how uh, great you are with playing uh, woodwinds, all sorts of woodwinds, uh, and also how good you are as an ensemble member because your perspective on how to play in a section uh, is always appreciated and illuminating to me. So thanks a lot Lachlan for doing this. I will leave all the details of Lachlan Davidson as usual in the podcast description but you know if you want to take a note uh, Lachlan has a very active website, which is lachlandavidson.com.au and where he sometimes uh, posts ideas, his uh, new releases, or also uh, sometimes backing tracks for his own music. So it's, it's a good place to be, Lachlan, uh, Lachlan's website. Uh, so... I, I'm really happy that you accepted my invitation to participate in, the po in this podcast because I believe you will have um, a lot to say about transcribing. So um, I will start with the first question, which is uh, why do you transcribe? Uh, I think I'm on a, a never-ending search for uh how to approach playing music and particularly how to improvise it's uh i think we we develop our own vernacular and our own way of approaching music but uh there are always different ways to do it and every player i ever hear has something new that interests me um to including my own playing i guess um, whether it be, you know, the actual notes they play, the way they put them together, it might be how they produce their sound, their articulation, their concept of time, 
um, even sometimes just a particular note they play that I, I, I love how they did that note. Uh, so that's, I'm listening to players for, for that perspective and, uh, you know, the term transcription, I, I, I do find an interesting one because I don't always write everything down, but um, I do assume that when you say transcribe, that uh, you, you do include mental transcription in that because that's that's actually how most of my transcription happens mental as mad or mental as <laughs> like insight uh, yeah well both yeah <laughs> <laughs> so did you so you are not like doing a physical transcription or sometimes you do but mostly you do you do it by listening several times uh, usually more than several. If, uh, if there's a particular, uh, and I very often do it in albums, um, where I'll listen to a whole album of, of a player I really like. And when I say player, it could be a band as well, because uh, one of my favourite things to do is write songs as well. So I'm often listening to albums, you know, to get a real sense of, of how they approach putting their music together. And and I'll listen a lot to one album. I, I've always worked on the premise of listen to a little a lot rather than listen to a lot a little. And that way I can get in real depth. And every time I listen, I listen to something different. And do you remember the time when somebody told you, oh, if you want to learn how to improvise or a bit more uh, jazz, you need to transcribe and did you immediately do it or it took you some time to get into it? Well, in fact, uh, I, I took, started to take jazz seriously when I went to the Victorian College of the Arts in 1983. Oh, sorry, no, I finished in 1983, in 1981, uh, in the first year of the jazz course there. And the, the other saxophone player was uh, Rob Burke in that year. And, um, you know, tremendous player and ed educator um, Rob, we got him very well, and, and he, he'd already been playing jazz for years, so um, I learned a lot just by being around him and the other members of the course and the staff. But uh, I'd already transcribed before I got there, uh, and we'll probably talk about a couple of those transcriptions before we uh, get too much further. But uh, when they said, yes, that's something you have to do, I thought, well, that makes sense. But I don't think I realised, I didn't know much about harmony before I got to the College of the Arts. So I'd only written down, you know, the notes and the rhythm of, of the solos I'd transcribed. And, uh, I, but I didn't really know much about chords. I mean, I knew what they were, but I didn't realise the importance of them, I think, until I got to the College of the Arts. And they, they set um, transcription tasks for us. And uh, I, I think, as well as being told the value of transcription, I learned it very quickly too. Yeah. And what were your expectations or what they still are? You know, what you expect to bring home when you transcribe? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it actually reflects a little bit of a conversation I had with Tony Gould many years ago when I said to him, you know, when you listen to music, what do you listen for? And uh, he was driving actually reasonably erratically on country roads as Tony does. Um, luckily there's no one else coming the other way, but uh, I think I made him think a bit more because he, he started crossing over to the other side of the road. And then he said, um, uh, I don't listen too closely and I listen to how they think. And for me, transcription is more about that than it is the specific uh, notes or lines that musicians play. It's how, it, how do they get there? Miles has been a particular one where, you know, what's he thinking to play how he plays? What's going on in his head? And that's what I look for in transcriptions. That's nice. I think you are one of the first who said that, you know, uh, but there is a constant that 
probably could be the subtitle of this podcast, which is not the notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the medicine in the clinic uh, is don't get the notes only. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more than that. Uh, yeah. And of um, course, if you if you are writing a transcription, you can't write everything down that a player plays. Um, absolutely. A, a, an interesting thing that I have done a number of times is transcribe myself. Um, and there's one particular instance, a, a piece that I wrote that's become one of my po more popular pieces for um, secondary students to play is a piece called The Listener. And I, I wrote that, well, when I say I wrote it, I composed that piece very quickly in that um, the initial tune came very easily. I, uh, I played in the piano part, which was pretty much four chords and uh, just played it with a bit of a modulation, figuring out what the form was. And then I played the melody in with some variations, did a bit of a solo on it, finished up with the melody, and then I transcribed what I'd played and uh, it was a, a very interesting exercise in figuring out how I thought. <laughs> yeah. An insight into my own consciousness. That's right. I'm always a bit reluctant to, to transcribe myself, even though I know the value of, mm. of that, the learning value of that, but I'm really afraid to realize that I'm not a great player. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. it, it's, well, that, it's like a battle inside me. Oh, should I just go myself? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to well, know. <laughs> yeah. Well, very interestingly, when I sent you um, the piece that you said you, you wanted to transcribe something and I, and I chose this piece and, and I had a bit of a listen to it and came to the same conclusion about myself that, uh, okay, yeah, that solo didn't turn out nearly as well as I hoped it had, I think. <laughs> so yeah, I you know, I I, I think we we probably do under undersell our undersell ourselves somewhat because we play how we play and we haven't arrived at that point lightly. Um, yeah. We we choose to play what we're playing just because we don't do what everybody else does yeah. doesn't necessarily lessen it. But I I know exactly how you feel. I do do. No, feel but definitely I, I listen. Uh, to what I play and I try to listen in order to catch uh, weaknesses and areas that need to be improved. So I definitely do that. I have never done it methodically. Uh, methodo methodo Me methodically. Methodically. <laughs> methodo Why I said chickadee? Oh, which should be changed. I like it better. Yeah, it was. And a new word, neologies. Um, but uh, I, I did a study on uh, different saxophone players and I released a little series of books, uh, small books, and the one I wrote on Joe Henderson, I had a lot of fun in analyzing three different songs played with like 30 or 35 years in between and try to understand how you know the language of Joe Anderson developed through those 30 years so one thing that I may be interested in is to analyze that journey you know when I started when I my first recording and my last recording and see you know whether I have crossed some uh, different ideas and developments, but it, it is interesting that. Sorry, it is interesting to. I've gone back and listened to some recordings from you know when I was mid twenties or, or thirty, and I'm still playing lots of the same ideas. Not all the same ones, and not necessarily using them in the same way, but a lot of the language is is still the same. Yep, yeah, that's right, and. Lachlan, how do you generally choose the solos you are going to transcribe? Is that... Oh, that's, that's a very long-winded process and it's called If I Like Them. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's just that simple. But and and very it... rare for me to to kind of take a whole solo um, completely um, seriously. I usually find there are parts of solos that I really like that I'll get into more depth in and, and try and work out. Yeah. Uh, is it like part of your research or is just something that catches your attention? I don't know, you listen to the radio or you are, I don't know, fooling around on band camp and playing random tracks and something catches your attention and it's, oh, I want to understand this. Or you do it deliberately like I want to. For example, I remember that 250 years ago, I went to have some... A long memory. <laughs> yeah, some jazz lessons in Rome from an outstanding teacher. Um, and he's a super fan of transcribing. And one day I said, I'm not happy with how I play the blues. So could you please help me to understand a little bit better? I find it very difficult. I prefer much to play on a standard at ABA than a blues. And he gave me few recordings of like B.B. King, John Lee Hooker, right? Which I probably didn't even know who they were. And when I put the recording on, I was upset because I said, what is this? You know, I want to learn to play the blues. You know, I don't want to listen to some, you know, blues guy. So I rang him and I said, I, I don't know what to do with those recordings. And he said, you listen to them. And maybe you, you start playing alone. Try to get their melodies. Try to play the melodies that they sing. Or in the case of B.B. King, you know, track down a couple of phrases that he plays on guitar. There is so much blues in there, you know, than in, I don't know, in Blue 7 played by Sonny Rollins. So you ask me that you want to learn a bit more and that's where you can learn. So that mm. again was a, uh, another big lesson. And I learned that if you are not happy with something, that's the thing to do. So sometimes I still do it. I have to play a funky tune and I'm, I'm not as good as you are in playing those styles. So I need to listen to some players that are very good at it and maybe start, you know, getting their vocabulary, their, their jargon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I find uh, I'm always asking uh, other other musicians about what they're listening to. And, you know, when someone says a name that I don't know, I'll always make a point of, of going and listening to it. Um, someone did tell me a couple of saxophone players to listen to the other day that I've never heard. And, um, and I've probably forgotten their names already. But, um, you know, they're, they're in my Spotify uh, list and I'll certainly be going back and, and listening to them. There was one really fine alto player who, uh, you know, I, I probably harshly would say slightly derivative of Cannonball, but isn't every alto player, uh, but certainly had some, you know, really interesting uh, approaches to improvising that, that I'd be interested to pick up, you know, and kind of go, yeah, that resonates with me. Um, and, you know, I do most of my listening in the car. And so it's very hard to transcribe while you're in the car, but you can work stuff out if possible. Um, and I always consider it oral training anyway. Um, and, you know, if, if there's a track that I particularly think, yeah, I like that solo again, or if I like that section of that solo, I'll, I'll play it again and I'll play it three or four times in a row in the car. Yeah. And, and then next time I pick my saxophone up, I'll probably you know, play something like that. I might even find the Spotify track again and, and, you know, if I like it enough, I'll do that. So if we 
<clears throat> dive a little bit deeper into your methodology? Do you have a specific methodology that you apply when you transcribe? Do you write it down immediately or you never write it down? Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, I think for, for me personally, I haven't written a transcription down in many years. But I, I can certainly say that I have, you know, mentally and then physically on the instrument transcribed things um, continuously through my whole playing career. Uh, and using that methodology where I'll, I'll find something, I'll play it over and over again, and uh, then I, I will, I tend to not tell, delve too deeply into transcriptions. I don't want to play exactly what someone else plays, uh, even though when I listen to my own playing, I still hear a lot of things that I know I've pinched from other players. Yeah. And, and I can point at them and go, you know, that's Tom Scott. Uh, I play a lot of Tom Scott licks. Sorry, I play a lot of Michael Brecker licks, and especially when I play the tenor. Um, you know, on the alto, uh, I'm pinching, pinching things from all the great alto players. And I, 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 I like the range of alto players, um, Desmond, Sanborn, Parker, Cannonball, and um, uh, one I always forget his name, and someone mentioned him today too, um, uh, Art Pepper. Mm. You know, they're probably the big, yeah. the big ones. Uh, and, I, and I can, you know, identify very often a lick that I've played, which is from an Art Pepper solo meets a rhythm section and probably even tell you what song it was from. Uh, but it doesn't, I haven't selected that before I've played it, but that's, it pops up from my, you know, <laughs> improvising vernacular. And uh, sometimes I'll go back and listen to those old, old albums again, and it refreshes my memory of them. And, you know, again, I'm not just listening to the notes, it's the whole, you know, it might be Art Pepper's rhythmic approach or, or you know, his, uh, it might even, uh, I know, uh, People talk about gestures and it might be his gestural approach uh, as opposed to Parker's or, you know, and then David Sanborn's whole gestural approach is totally different to any of them. And, uh, and then Paul Desmond, you know, he's potentially more um, calculated approach, you know, in, in some ways, I think on his, on his live performances, it's less so. But on his recordings, he sounds a bit more calculated and, you know, people describe him as being a bit more classical, which is pretty funny because he's not really, he just has a, a lighter sound. But um, so often what I'm listening for is, is again, how they think and different aspects of their playing. Yeah, yeah Paul Desmond has been criticised all his life for not being jazz mm. or pure jazz. And yeah, I remember a long conversation even with my father. My father was a big fan of Paul Desmond. And he had all those albums, both original, uh, when my father was playing on cruise ships and they were stopping in New York in late 50s, early 60s. So he bought wow. all those albums and as soon as they were available and then he transferred all the album on a geloso uh, tape recorder right. and play half speed so Paul Desmond was sounding like a Jay Mulligan oh, right <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah under, probably would a little bit under sleeping pills <laughs> but at, at least he said I could transcribe even the fast passages and, mm. and he yeah, was yeah well I must admit I, yeah. I try not to slow things down if I possibly can just but that's mostly to test my ears out um, yeah that was one question so you you don't use generally any software to slow it down or to no. isolate a bit more the, yeah the... look there's certainly value in that and uh, uh, you know the fact that on YouTube you can play things half speed I was helping a student recently transcribe something and uh, and um, I guess a, a question I didn't finish earlier was that you can't write everything down. And you, you look at transcriptions and there are often little crosses where they've written down, well, I think this is what note they meant to play. 
<laughs> but again, you know, the time as well, because jazz musicians so often muck around with rhythm and, you know, if they're playing back on the beat, you can go, well, that's that rhythm, but that's that rhythm played really late. So, you know, how, how anyone ever transcribes Dexter yeah. Gordon, I'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, you, you know, uh, so I think if you're going to write it down, you've got to listen to it as well and use the two bits of information. Yeah. I mean, all the music that you put on paper is already going through a compromise mm. you know, between what you hear in your mind and what you put down. Even if you yeah. write in a, in a sort of classical way where you write everything, there's no improvisation, but that's already a compromise that you, need, is, yeah. to, you need to accept. Uh, because uh, music shouldn't be written, actually. Mm. We should do like uh, what Indians do. You know, uh, they just transmit music orally and mm. they never write down. And if you go to a music lesson, it's all oral. And yeah. This is one of my biggest dreams of, you know, found uh, um, a, a music school where every page of music is banned from the music school. Well, uh, it's very interesting you say that, uh, you know, I am now playing in a, in a classical saxophone quartet and um, I'm lucky enough that they're happy to play my compositions, at least try them anyway. And I did have a concept only two days ago, very much along those lines of what you're saying, in that I would compose a saxophone quartet without any sheet music. And I would I would teach it to them yeah. part by part and, and say, you know, uh, probably I, I think probably the best way would be to go, here's a recording of your part. Yeah. That's how I want it to go. It's it's a longer process. And of course, if you imagine in, in the tertiary level, it will take probably eight years to complete, you know, a decent, <laughs> a decent course. But I think it would be much more efficient, you know, in the end. But unfortunately, we live in a very fast and quick time. And even students yeah. sometimes, you know, they go and search for already written transcriptions. And then they spend a lot of time trying to memorize them. While when you transcribe, it's so easy to memorize because you spend so much time on the same two bars mm. that you memorize and transcribe at the same time. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard to convince them. You know, uh, yeah. you know in the end, it will require less time. Uh, yeah. I remember I, I played my master uh, classical saxophone exam from memory but it took me like two years to prepare, mm. right? Yeah. Playing the same it. repertoire for two years. Well, if I do a transcription, maybe it take, takes me one week, but in the end, it's memorized, it's there. Yeah. And also, I will have all the things that you mentioned, you know, all the subtleties that uh, if you just read a transcription, you will never be able to but it's, it's very interesting because I um, this podcast is <clears throat> alternating with some episodes where I do uh, transcriptions in, in real time or I just analyze a transcription that I have done at a separate time uh, and I talk about the process of transcribing so all the questions like how would you write that and mm -hmm. I started with a track that I love so much, which is <clears throat> The Cost of Living in the first Michael Brecker album. <clears throat> uh, are you familiar with that track? It's a, it's a ballad no, written by Don Grolnik. It's a right. fantastic piece of music. And so I transcribed the melody and then Charlie Hayden's solo and then Michael Brecker's solo. And... So the videos are on YouTube if you like or if the listeners have missed that. And most of the questions were, you know, how you write that, how I'm going to write that. And I, I'm very clear that 
you need to compromise. You, you need to find a way that is close enough. Mm-hmm. And I like to write on top of the notes uh, some things that can help me understanding or remembering what was going on. Like from yeah. simple layback to like uh, a sound description of some sort like harsh or metallic or nasal that I can remember that or even yeah. tuning things like play flat, play sharp. Yeah, because it's important yeah. in the end, you know, yeah. it's all part of And then obviously different kinds of vibrato are very hard to notate too. Vibrato is something that I like to yet yeah, take note of. Uh, but I remember that especially on Michael Brecker's solo, I was very happy to slow it down and to catch things that I think, I thought, I mean, they were like, oh, this is like a diminished scale. It was like, I guess that the sound was close enough, but then slowing to like 30%, you could hear all the notes and then say, oh, it's almost a diminished, but then it becomes you know, this or that. And and also a few few days ago, I was helping a student with a Charlie Parker, uh, Now's the Time transcription, and we slowed down a lot. And I just discovered Charlie Parker's tonguing that comes out very clear when you slow it down. We were playing like 50% or 40%. And it's an amazing, amazing. You you can feel that he's tonguing, and I could almost imagine how to put my tongue in that. And it was very helpful, helpful, for example, to explain ghost notes that mm-hmm. it's very difficult to teach, as you know. You know, I can I can teach the student the theory behind it, but then. I can't put my my hand inside the mouth yeah. and say yeah, put the right. tongue like that. Mm. Uh, but when you listen to it, you can hear and you can imagine the movement of the tongue on the reed that sometimes yeah. is a little bit higher, sometimes it's a little bit lower because mm. you can hear that the sound is clearer on some instances. So yeah. that was very illuminating. And thanks to the slowing down, yeah yeah that i mean that makes me you know think about the other thing that i do when i'm copying a solo or or taking you know ideas from a solo that i'm not just copying how people are thinking but i'm also copying how it feels to play that technique you know you're talking about how the how the tongue hits the reed i guess if you're slowing down you're actually saying yeah how does how does the tongue Feel on the reed. How does the mouthpiece feel in the mouth? How does the air feel? How how are they feeling? Are they feeling tense or are they feeling relaxed? Or, you know what's there. So I mean the feeling and what happens in the mind to me are indelibly linked. They're often separated, but to me how how they feel and how they think is you know inseparable. Absolutely. But also just just the physical. Um, relationship with the instrument how does that feel how do their fingers feel on the instrument you know how does it feel to play that thing how does it feel to make that note sound like it does you know yeah um lachlan if you are going to practice something that you have transcribed again what is your process to try to incorporate uh, what you transcribe yeah. oh. in, into your playing. Yeah. Um, more of the time I'm loosely um, getting an idea of, of what the players played. So uh, more often I'm playing kind of what I remembered, but if there's something really specific that I want to get, I'll um put on a little bit play it a few times uh play the recording a few times 
you know, as small as I need to go. And, um, and then play it back. And, uh, you know, I love the idea of actually putting it on a loop with it then with a gap after the loop. Um, I can't say this is something I do, but um, ideally this is what I would do. So I get my little bit that goes again, and, and do that. And if, if I'm not getting it, harbor. And then, and I love the comparing thing backwards and forwards. That's something I do with students a lot too, especially younger improvisers and younger jazz players who still need some style. In fact, I do it even when I'm teaching classical saxophone too, that, um, you know, play and copy, play and copy and repeat the repetition is key. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, sometimes I, tr I try to, to employ the, the Indian system that I mentioned earlier, mm. uh, which is I play something and I'm not going to change. I'm not saying anything. I simply repeat the same thing until the student got it right. So when the student hears me changing what I play, knows that he did it right. And even when he thinks, oh, or she thinks I've done it right, if I'm repeating, uh, there is something else, you know, that Mm. So I keep repeating the same like and the student goes de do da and I go and the student da da and I keep I keep doing the same and then eventually and and now I change. Yeah. Which is Well very often what I'll yeah. I'll I'll keep going beyond that because if they've got it right once it's not enough um because it's not going to stick um you know and to to expand on the indian concept um you know my understanding is that they do 10 things in a row perfectly before they move on and it's hard to give things that time and i say to students if you want things to be really really good that's what you do if you want them to be quite good five times is is still good five times in a row perfectly um but your minimum is three three times in a row perfectly gives you some kind of handle on it. it means you can do it and you can probably do it again. Um, any more than that, you know, is just way better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably I, I kind of imagine your answer to the next question, but have you ever felt you were copying someone? Uh, as a result of transcribing that artist? Yeah, uh, of course. And um, is it a bad thing? Look, I, when I first started went at, the, at the College of the Arts and early in my career, and it continues to this day, the drive to be original. Uh, but, you know, I've thought a lot about that. Obviously, you have, and it's one of those things that as jazz musicians, we have to think about. But if I never listened to jazz and I never played a phrase in jazz that somebody else had played, then I, I wouldn't be playing jazz because jazz, the phrases that other people play are part of the vernacular. And it's, it's I, I liken to my students, it's the same way we decide what phrases and and words we're going to use when we speak. You know, sometimes we'll hear someone say something and we'll, we won't, don't even need to think about it, but sometimes we'll hear them, you know, someone will go, absolutely. They go, that's perfect. I'm going to say absolutely, because it just fits everything. And someone else might say, uh, top of the morning to you. They might think, I really like that. I'm going to say that too. And to me, that's the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the whole point um, is that we become authentic with our usage of it. And it, it is very bothersome when you hear a regurgitator as a player who 
plays something because that's what Michael Brecker did. And they so they go, I'm going to do that Michael Brecker lick rather than going, this is something I really like and it becomes part of me. You know, I, I mean, I know I'm not telling anything new to you and I'm sure probably most of the other people you've interviewed have a very similar way of thinking about things in that you have to make it your own. Uh, and, you know, your, your choice about what you play as much as possible um, is, I'm going to use that term authentic, whatever that means, but it's a, it's a heartfelt choice. It's not, um, it's not made lightly, but, and it's, it's made for the right reasons and whatever the right reasons are is a very difficult thing to go into, but um, you, yeah, inevitably you're going to be copying, I think, um, just how much you copy and the way that you copy is what it comes down to. And it's a very big discussion and it's the hardest thing to talk about. I know. It's, I think the reason why I ask this question to all my guests Great uh, question. Uh, is a bit pedagogical because sometimes, uh, or should I say often students are posing that question. Like, oh, do I really have to transcribe this? I don't want to be the copy of nobody. And mm -hmm. so maybe all, all these answers that my guests are uh, providing will help them to be convinced that it's a good thing. <laughs> mm. it's, and, it's, a, it's a necessary thing. And I think what you said is, is key to this matter. You have to be authentic. And then... If that line originally, you know, uh, got into you through your ears from a recording that was recorded 70 years ago, that doesn't matter anymore as mm. far as you are honest and true with it. So it's mm. not the process shouldn't be, I'm going to use this uh, cannonball line now because the chords are the same but it should be i'm playing this line because i can feel it's appropriate and you might mm. not even remember what was yeah. the origin of that line yeah absolutely and and it's it, it's a fine distinction between those two things but when you hear a player on either side of that line it's actually very clear you know, you, you get whether they're authentic or whether they're not. Yeah. Um, and look, I've heard it with people rehearsing ensembles, standing at the front of the ensemble, saying all these words to your ensemble that are supposed to help the ensemble, and they sound regurgitated. They sound like, I'm saying that because George Luggie Smith said that, whereas they might say the same thing because they hear that that's what the ensemble needs. And I see it very similarly, you know, the the as far as possible we aim to be very honest but it is hard sometimes to know which side of the line you're standing on at any given moment and i think you know probably all of us straddle it yeah another guest uh, of the podcast uh, the great pat la barbara said you know if you if you try to play something that you prepared at home it never works. And mm. he says, the demonstration is very simple. You trade force with another player and you prepare something and then the player before you plays something completely different from what you prepared. And then if you do it, it will sound dumb. It will sound stupid. Yeah. This is no more related to what's going on. So it's impossible. You have to prepare your own language and vocabulary, but then you cannot write down the the speech that you are going yeah. to give, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It does remind me of an experience I had years ago uh, where I, I played with a, a very famous Australian jazz musician who loves swapping fours. And, um, but I had a very different vernacular to him 
that I liked to use. I liked to play a certain way and we were very different players. And so we couldn't have a conversation when I played that way because he didn't play the same stuff as me and was fairly inflexible actually in, in what he played. There was no, no sense of him being willing to engage with how I played. So I ended up thinking, well, we need to make music out of this. So I need to talk his language. And it was the only way I could make it work. Mm. It was quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily we need to uh, say, the th say things in the same way, but... No, I, I felt that was an exception to the rule too. Most people are a bit more flexible. Or maybe, maybe I'm just suggesting, uh, maybe he wasn't listening too deeply because I... Th I think it's fine if you keep your language as far as you are listening because you don't have only one color in your playing. So, mm, of course, yeah. But you have to understand, you know, what's the situation. And this is quite related. So maybe that musician that you were playing with, he wasn't listening too carefully or wasn't interested in, in a dialogue, as you said. So yeah, he was that's, playing that's, his stuff. That's was, but that was my feeling. A dialogue presumes that you are listening <laughs> to what the other True. person says and then you well, yeah, inter... you can say the opposite but it's still a conversation yeah and you don't have to give up with your own uh, vernacular but you mm. can still have a conversation you know but if you yeah. stop listening and if you just it's a monologue and it's not interesting anymore yeah and and the feeling is is pretty bad because to me, it's, it's like the whole meaning of playing improvised music is taken away. It's no more there. And Absolutely. it's not fun anymore. Yeah. It's like playing with Ariel Pro. Yes. And usually it's not, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so much have been doing, so much, so many of us have been doing that a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah, but. We do it to practice, but then when we yeah. can, you know, we we rather play with humans that uh, luckily will be listening. Hopefully, yeah. Um, all right, so um, we are heading towards the end. I'm just asking you, uh, what are your favorite solos that you have transcribed, or? It's a bit of a dumb question, but if you are forced to choose one solo to bring with you on, on Mars, uh, what that would be? Yeah, well, I know what it is. And um, unfortunately, I can never remember the name of the tune. Um, so I'll talk about the first couple of solos that I transcribed. Yeah. Because uh, they, they had a huge impact on on how I played the alto saxophone. And they were when I was at school, before I went to the College of the Arts. We're talking late 70s, so 1979, 1980. And uh, I'm unashamedly a fan of, of good pop music. My favourite band is Steely Dan. But uh, on this occasion, the song that was all over the radio was Just The Way You Are, Billy Joel. And Phil Woods', Phil Woods. solo is legendary, yeah. uh, and and I, I, well, I think of that solo, and I think of I think of hearing it in my head on the school bus. I don't, so I don't think it was playing on the school bus. It might have been, but uh, I wrote that one down uh, in pencil on manuscript and uh, learned to play it. And it was, I think. Only later that I realised, you know, that there, always, there were all these clever flat fives in it and, um, you know, a couple of his classic lines that he used in it, but it was really melodic. Ba -da -do, ba -da -da -do. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think that solo is so well built mm. and, and you know, Lachlan, how hard it is to play a pop solo on a pop song because most likely you have few bars and you have to be very good and of course you want to put something that you will be 
probably be re remembered in, in a good way. You know, mm. you just didn't play a bunch of notes or crazy stuff, but you have to be solid, simple, and you know, in, in that solo in particular, there is everything that you need to know to, to be a good soloist. So there is yeah. motivic development, there is uh, a good sense of time. Yeah, uh, but yeah, mostly, the plan. it always struck me the sound of that solo. The sound. I mean, mm. Phil Woods has one of the gorgeous sounds, you know, on yeah. alto saxophone. And his timing is absolutely perfect. Uh, but that solo in particular, it, it's another singer. Mm. It's another singer and all the phrases are, you know, a lesson on how to make uh, your, your horn singing. Yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. And I understand I... now that you said it, why you have such a great sound. You know, you, you are the first alto reference in, in at least here in Melbourne, but I'm, I'm pretty sure even, you know, wider in, in Australia. And I always loved your sound, you know, from, from the first moment. And maybe you know, uh, I understand now that if you love that solo in particular, uh, you yeah. have a close relation to, to that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. The second solo I, I transcribed was also Phil Woods, and uh, it was his um, solo break at the end of Paul Simon's Have a Good Time. Mm. Um, and I just, it, I was very impressed. I always loved playing fast, and I didn't have the facilities of slowing things down in those days. And it's a pretty fast solo, and I didn't really understand the jazz articulation that he was using. Um, you know, he pretty well tongued off the beat all the way through it um, and you know, had a few kind of diminished things that he does. It had lots of his normal ideas thrown in, but just all packed together. And uh, I found that very impressive. I'm not sure how close I got to getting it right in yeah. those days, yeah. uh, but I was, I was really attracted to it. Um, you know, you talk about transcribing. I had an album of Phil Woods, um, I can't remember how I found it. I reckon I probably heard a track or two from it on um, Jim McLeod's uh, jazz track or even Music to Midnight that was bef before that on the ABC and went out and bought the, the vinyl, which I still have. And it was called Floresto Canto. And it was mostly Latin music uh, recorded in London with great orchestrations. Uh, if I had my memory working properly, I could tell you who the orchestrator was too, because I've listened a lot to those, you know, another way of transcribing. I, I transcribe mentally orchestrations and listening to that all the time. Uh, and melody and harmony relationships, you know, from a composing perspective. But uh, Floresto Canto, certainly in the 80s would have been my most listened to album. And I learned to play every, almost every bit of every tune on that album, the way Phil Woods did. Have you ever um, heard uh, a Michel Legrand album called Le Grand Jazz? I reckon I've heard tracks from it and it would have been um, Phil Woods playing um, yeah. uh, da, 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 The Rest of Your Life, whatever that song's called. No, what are you doing the rest no, of your life? They don't Not do on that, that album, no? No, I know that he played a, a live version with, with Michel Legrand. There is the, right. the video on YouTube. Well, Le Grand is, is an album that he made for Philips with Miles Davis, Bill Evans, John Coltrane, Phil Woods, Mill Jackson. And wow. I think there is, uh, who's playing drums? Uh, Jimmy Cobb or, yeah, probably. I can't remember who's the drummer. I'll have but to go and listen to that. Yeah, you have to. And they play standards. You are arranged by Michel Legrand. He had, basically, the story goes that he had a huge success with those two musicals that he wrote in France that became a huge success. And Philips was so happy that gave him a blank check and said, do whatever you like. 
Oh, we pay for it. So he went to New York, spent a week there, and you know, called the best, best musicians. And the, Phil plays a fantastic version of Night in Tunisia. He plays the solo on that, and it's beautiful. The arrangement is great too, but his solo is memorable. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say, uh, you mentioned, oh yes, did you know that initially we have a, we had, I think it's not operating anymore, a jazz label called Philology, named after Phil Woods. Wow. So there was this guy in, in Macerata, Macerata is the town where the Borgany factory is. Uh, and there is this guy, a passionate, a jazz lover, who started this uh, jazz label and he was crazy about Phil Woods and the logo is Phil's hat, you know. Right. The, and uh, actually my second album as a, as a soloist was released by Philology. Right. And yeah, yeah he, he also recorded many albums with Phil Woods in it. So you can check those albums. Philology, yeah, will do. Yeah, two. I've so, got some homework to do. <laughs> uh, did it come to your mind? What's your favorite solo? Uh, well, I can tell you what album it's on, and uh, maybe I can find it for you, and you can put it in the notes on the side. Yeah. I'll make I'll make a point of doing that. It's uh, it's on a Bob Berg album. Okay. I can't think what that's called either. It's one that it has um, a track that features David Sanborn. And on that track, there is also a steel drum solo. And I've tried to figure out who the steel drum player is on that track. And each time I look it up, I seem to come up with a different answer, um, but it may have been the bass player. And it, uh, it just comes from the right place. It's, um, yeah, it's a really special solo um, on not many chords. There's beautiful space, great thematic um, uh, use of themes, I guess, um, and motives, and and it's just really melodic and the, the heart in it, and and the rhythm. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I love it more than any other solo I've heard. I can sing it, but I can't tell you the name of the tune, which is, you know, that's that that's an indication of how, what my memory is drawn to. I don't yeah. tend to remember names of things, I just remember things. Yeah. Now that, that's all right. If you just let me know, I'll make sure yeah. that I put that in it's, the it's, it's notes. In those notes, just there, right now. Yes. And uh, thanks a lot, Lachlan Davidson. It has been a pleasure to have you on another episode of this podcast. And all the listeners can chase Lachlan's gig uh, now that we can play again. Uh, he's very active in Melbourne and in all Australia and hopefully soon internationally. So whenever you have a chance, uh, go to a gig where Lachlan is playing, you won't be disappointed. And if you want to learn a bit more about him, he has a very uh, nice website, lachlandavidson.com.au, where you can also purchase some music and some uh, written music that you can memorize at a second time. So thanks a lot, Lachlan, and hear all of you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Mecca.